I'm Rhonda Schaffler, anchor at The Deal, here to discuss carve-out transactions with Matt Herman, a partner at Freshfields. Good to see you here, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start with a definition. What are carve-out transactions? How common are they? And what are some of the principal challenges in them? Well, the first thing is it is the sale of a division, a business line, or even a select group of assets. I think it's important to distinguish that kind of a transaction versus the sale of the entirety of a corporate group, like you might see in a public M&A transaction. The, the splitting of that division, the, the pulling it apart, uh, ultimately is the thing that gives rise to, to some of the unique challenges that are present in these kind of transactions. First, I think having a mutual understanding between buyer and seller in understanding the asset and liability perimeter that's created in a carve-out uh, is, is critical. That puts pressure on documentation. Uh, that puts pressure on due diligence, that puts pressure on valuation. A lot of times business divisions within a larger corporate group don't have independent financial statements. Sometimes you'll prepare them, a seller might prepare them, uh, carve out financials in the context of getting ready for the deal, but ultimately uh, pulling the thing apart and establishing a mutually agreed asset and liability perimeter is probably the first and most important critical item for buyers and sellers to get right. The second principle unique difference of, of this kind of tra transaction versus other deals is that there might be services and other elements that allow the business to kind of stand on its own two feet in the hands of a buyer. And that's going to be different for different kinds of buyer. For example, a private equity buyer might require more services and for longer periods of time. And a corporate buyer might be able to take the business and sort of fold it into its own corporate group with less of a need and less reliant for, trans uh, for, for transition. <clears throat> for transition and for other kinds of, of services. Ultimately, the exercise of pulling the thing apart is just is taking away and pulling apart the synergies that the corporate seller would have created over the last years and when it's uh, when it's held the business. So, what are some of the issues involved with the transfer of assets and operations when it's global? It, global makes it that much harder. Um, there are a few a few important points to keep in mind. Um, first of all, is making sure that you can convey that asset and liability perimeter we just talked about effectively and efficiently from the seller to the buyer. That's going to involve tax. That's going to involve uh, international uh, financial reporting. It's, it could involve uh, you know, legal limitations in the way that you can convey uh, assets and liabilities in lots of different countries. It may involve timing steps. So getting the, the conveyancing structure right and the documentation, including through tax, is critically important. Secondly, even if the business isn't regulated, like a financial services business, it may have lots of uh, permits and other governmental approvals necessary to run the business on day one. Sometimes a corporate seller would have a permit that runs the entirety of a portion of its group. That may need to be split up and splitting that up and making sure that a buyer is able to operate the business legally and in compliance with law on day one is, is a critical thing and that's true, for both, that's true for both corporate buyers and for private equity buyers. Lastly, the most, one of the most important things that comes across in any carve-out transaction, indeed in any M&A transaction, is making for sure that the workforce comes across smoothly. Uh, there are lots of places where employees, uh, where, where the transfer of employees gives rise to other kinds of concerns, whether it be work counsel or structuring the deal in such a way so that the entirety of the workforce is both delivered to the buyer and is done so in a way that's where, the, where that workforce is properly incentivized going forward. So those three challenges, the legal conveyancing point, uh, making sure that the business is able to operate lawfully and in compliance with law on day one, and effective transfer of the workforce are, are three of the uh, most important elements of doing this on a, on a global and international basis. And Matt, the important question about adding value, how do these deals add value for PE and strategics? Well, for PE, in the traditional ways, and I think the drivers there are around putting financial leverage on the business, and secondly, incentivizing management. Remember, management is now no longer a part of a larger corporate group. They're going to be working for an independent organization that is a business uh, that where they can uh, receive proper equity uh, and other uh, incentive compensation to drive uh, real value into the business for its new private equity owner. And I think a lot of times folks will see that uh, as a very freeing experience and allow them to really drive value uh, in, the form of, uh, in the form of just having a different owner. For strategics, I think it's a little bit more nuanced. I mean, I think you have to come to the conclusion as a carve-out buyer, who's a corporate buyer, that this platform will do better within your corporate group than it does in the seller. Now, on the same time, you should understand how it fits in a little bit better, and you'll be a little bit farther up the curve 
than another buyer might be, but really understanding how that value is going to be different on your platform versus the current platform is going to be the key for strategic buyers. Matt, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I'm Rhonda Schaffler with The Deal.